Welcome to fucking hell. <laughs> and actually, we're sitting here in front of the free marcher hole in Seattle. Today's video is going to be a video called What If? And what we mean by what if is exploring questions where we don't have the answers. Mm -hmm. And we're just going to speculate on an answer for something, but we don't have the answer because it's going to be a little bit outlandish, almost like the, the show The X-Files for personal development. So in this episode of What If, we're going to ask the question, what if there's no such thing as heaven or hell as the way that many people would interpret it, but rather there is a heaven or hell here on earth and that you can actually live in different energetic realms of heaven or hell while alive. For me, the, the first time I've been to hell, like the, the first time that really stands out out of two was um, prior to the, the scandal. And, I, and you remember this one where I was really, really caught in this like rut of um, chasing validation, chasing approval. Um, that's all I cared about. Like I'd wake up and I'm like, get more approval. You know, I was teaching dating advice for men. I'm like, get more women, get this. And I remember you like would come home and, <laughs> well, no, you remember, you, no, do, you'd come do, to like do, do, to the do. place and like, a I'd be, person, yeah. you, you were a different person at the time. <laughs> no, this, this was, was very, very, no, this was like my dark times before the scandal. And I remember like, you'd come over and like, you'd be like, Hey, you know, we should work on this. And I'm like, wait, get more and I'd be like on hmm. Tinder just swiping a message and I'm like look another one and I just look possessed dude and I remember like there was this like I, I wasn't even me it's like something took over and even thinking about it now I'm like how could this have been me but I was just like more more or I'd like replay the video and like rewind replay Can I rewind this? replay I want to describe this yeah. okay, this is what it was like so I'm friends with Julian been fr we've, we've been friends and he, he, he reads, um, I think it was The Art of Seduction by Robert Greene. Oh. And he gets this idea, he sees this thing called The Puppeteer. And he just keeps going on and on. He's like, yeah, 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 I don't know why. With my new girlfriend there. And, he, and he, this is with, you know, my ex-ex. And, and, and he just keeps going. And she's like the sweetest little thing. And he's like, I am the puppeteer. And she's like, are you okay, Julian? She sees the good in people. So she's looking at him. And, and he's, he's like, the puppeteer, look what I can do. Look what I can do. And, he, and then give, the, give the, him a guy in this mindset, Tinder. And he just, he's sitting there blowing up everything on Tinder. And then, he, and then he, I remember like you, you'd go on these trips and you'd come back. You're like, I'm going out tonight. The shit's going down. And you're having fun with people. And, you're, and people in, what's crazy is that people like what you're doing. That's what's so funny about it. They're actually enjoying it because they're loving it, to, to tell you the truth. I mean, frankly, what they're running away from is people being friendly to them and they're running towards you. <laughs> but it's just so crazy. But I mean, and that's a whole other video topic or maybe in this video topic, like why they would even feel drawn to that is like a video unto itself, something that, that our female viewers could actually learn a lot from to improve their lives. But the point being is that I watched you do this and I could see that, that your mind was fixating Yep. and fixating and this is a great story too because I've had a number of friends who I've watched go into that realm and you always hope that they're going to come out and some don't and they go deeper and deeper down so you're lucky that you had intervention okay. and and that you came out of that but it sounds like this is kind of my first time even hearing you kind of describing that yeah. experience because I kind of just roll with it and kind of support but I'm, I'm curious to see how you would oh dude yeah I had well I had it twice like I had it first with um, there was that clip I, I talked about this in a few videos, like watching Breaking Bad, and there's this one scene where he's like, "I'm not in the money business, I'm in the empire business," and that's when I was like, uh, mid travel, just hustling on building the brand. This is even before, mm. and I remember like falling asleep, just replaying empire business, and I'd be like, empire business, empire business, just like fixating on it. And then the one that came after was the puppeteer, and I remember I was reading that book <laughs> in Hawaii, <laughs> like this is no joke. I'm reading it. I'm the puppeteer. Yeah, well, there's that scene in Breaking Bad yeah. where he opens the storage locker and it's just all this cash piled. That's when he says that Empire business. Yeah. That line's amazing. Dude, yeah. So is that... You combine in the, that and Puppeteer and you have a hell of a combination. Uh, well, then I read it's like the Puppeteer and I remember it's in Hawaii and I was falling asleep. I'm like, I'm the Puppeteer. I'm the, and just like uh, fixate, fixate. And then everything, the, all my thoughts like, how can you fuel this Puppeteer? Like, And I remember like, yeah, talking to the girl you were seeing and I was like, look, I'm the Puppeteer. And I'd like send a text like, look, they respond. <laughs> I'm fucking uh, pulling the strings. Uh, I'm put, like insane. And um, you were very good at it too. Yeah, like, well, no one can deny you were good at what you were doing. Yeah, no, but but even thinking back now, it's like it's weird because like it's so hard to even picture what that felt like then. Mm -hmm. Like I'm laughing about it now, but at the time I was like full serious and like you could just see it in my eyes. Like I wasn't even there. It was like I'm there. And Tell like, them how you felt about the end. Probably tears. The end. The, the roving drone. <laughs> 
<laughs> like what? I just felt like I was like floating through the air and just like one and another. And then it was insane. Like, yeah, just delusional. Um, but no, that was. But don't do that. <laughs> but don't do that. Yeah, that's not awesome. Well, it's weird because it, no, no, it, <laughs> it sounds extremely appealing if you've, if, depending on who you are and the place you come from. Like, that's what I always thought I wanted. Um, but it's the, the complete opposite. Like, you get lured into hell. The hallmark of low vibration energy or negative energy is that you get, it's like if you do a, a line of Coke, right? You get this super big payoff up at the front, you're high off your face. And then later you you pay the price for it. So what you were getting there was you were being fueled by low vibration energy, and you're just living the rock star life, and it's just balling. But then at the same time, when it comes bang, comes crashing down, uh, it's gonna hit you hard. And if you don't know that that's coming, it hits you very very hard. It also reels you in by always needing more. You know, it's like at first like you can just have this. I'm like. I'll take it. And then it's like you become numb to it. And it's like more, 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 more. And you just get pulled down. It's literally like a drug. Like people say like, you know, you do it the first time and it's amazing. And then the second time. And then you reach that point where you don't really enjoy it anymore. But you have to do it. You get desensitized to the drugs. Yeah. So you get desensitized and you always need more. So it was more of like this. It was very just compulsive. So it's like, yeah, you could be viewing it as like, look, you're getting all the validation. But it's like coming from this compulsive. Like, I need more. I need more. Oh, my God. More, more, more. So it was like internally it just felt horrible. But, I, but you also, you're also somebody who when you were doing that, you look like you didn't. You were very good at getting validation. But yes. I never saw you. I never saw you looking taken down almost ever. Was that just because you're so good at getting it? Or was it you had such trust in your, in your ability to get it? Or was it that you um, that you're hiding it? Or like, what was that? I guess I wouldn't show it. But I was definitely in that loop of just like more like why is this not working and just like just kind of like lost there because like I was always thinking like I thought when I got all the validation and women and money I'd be complete and then it's like I have it all now and then that what started fucking with me it's like you know I have more money than I could spend especially when you travel and you just have a suitcase all the girls all the experiences all the validation from them from men uh, travel cool access to cool things I'm like why am I not fulfilled and it would just freak me out so I was you know, numbing it, and I was really good at giving my fix of numbness, but the, internally, it's like, I just felt bad and gun to the head. It's like, no, help. I'm just, I don't have any control. It's just okay. like, kind of like, gone. Here's, here's what I was seeing was, for the first, like, 90% of it, I, I basically just saw women throwing themselves at you. Yeah. So to me, it was like, they're having a win, and I'm just looking at this, I'm like, I mean, because I would go, maybe go talk to a girl, and then you would talk to the same girl, and you get a better response than me. So I'm looking at it, I'm like, hey, no harm, no foul. I mean, who am I to argue with what they want? But then at the same time, um, uh, what I would see was that, was that um, it was like you, you would kind of like push a button and you get the girl chasing, but then a lot of time it wouldn't even necessarily be a girl that you wanted. Mm. I saw a lot of that. It was like not even a girl that you wanted. Like you would text like... I wanted like, everyone to chase. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, it didn't yeah. matter who. It's like Do you know what I thought it was? I thought that you were almost like a, like a hot girl in a man's body. That was actually my rationale. Because you understand women, women's psyche so well. So I was like, okay, maybe he understands women's psyche so well because he, he himself was like a hot girl to man's body. But then the way that you're doing it, like women would do with, say, Instagram, but you're doing it with, um, with uh, social interaction, right? Yeah. So that's how I took it. But I could also see that you were kind of fixating. So I would see you like get girls to chase that you didn't even intend on linking up with. So w- when I saw you doing it with girls who, um, who, who were really into you and then you had a, a further interaction with them, I'm like, okay, that, that's just like really kind of crafty but then when I saw you kind of doing it when you didn't even care if you saw them again I'd, I would keep asking you I was like so like why and you're like <laughs> empire like whatever you'd say and I'm like okay <laughs> and I think also that you're downplaying yourself a bit because yes that was definitely an element of where you're at but at the same time you were, you were always still a very nice personable guy so and, and, and always out to help people like the joke that people would make to me after like the Julian thing is they're like, have you like met Julian? That's like the nicest guy. Like he'll come That's in. What and- I said to you first. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you said like I remember, like, the, I remember uh, one time I was at uh, uh, your place that you had a while ago, and I had never even met Julian. I wasn't with RSD at the time. We were just friends, and I remember I was on a phone call, and you, Julian, you come in and you uh, you grab the blender and bring it into another room with some items, and then I walk into that room and I'm still in the call, being like, did. Are you are you trying to make something like this is your place more than it's mine like make it here and then he's he's blending something in a different room as I'm on the phone yeah, being like is this the Julian guy everyone's so mad at he's like the nicest guy in the world I'm like oh don't let the blender it's too loud <laughs> I hope that doesn't bother you disrupt the call uh-huh. yeah, yeah. yeah so you had that and then and then so that was kind of the lead in of the fixation and then I guess that that kind of bleeds into the kind of karmic and again this is a what if video does karma exist is it not 
We don't know. I don't have proof. I wish I could just zoom out and be like, hey, God, is there karma? And like, it's God's up there. He's like, yes, there is, you fucking idiot. <laughs> it's obvious. And I'm like, thanks, God. But that's just, it's, you know, that's just the fucking free one troll. So we're just going to go off of speculation. That's why video is about what if. So let's say there is karma, and we could even dive into that, maybe in this video or another, we'll see where it goes, but the idea being that you experience that, and then now you have the karmic payback, right? The, the bill, you know, Satan is there with the bill. That validation, I think, almost preloads and primes and pumps up the hell that's about to be, like, deployed upon you. <laughs> for every, 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 like, for me, for example, I just thought I was depressed or I thought I was, I thought I was in a bad mood or whatever it is. But looking back on it, thinking about these different levels of energy you talk about, I really was living a hell on earth. And then I can kind of look back at the different times of varying degrees that the hell was actually occurring. And I remember that each time was preloaded by a lot of instant gratification positivity, and then the payload was the come down of the drug, essentially. So that hell on earth very rarely was random or just, or just put on me. So whether karma exists or not, there is this pendulum that's being built up, this, this, yeah, thing, that's being, this, this, this thing that's being ratcheted up to then boo, get launched off into this place of hell. And the problem is, is when you get lower and lower and lower, whether you call it low vibration energy or just bad shit happening, each thing really just pulls you and it's almost like you're, you're in a jungle and a branch keeps snapping and snapping and snapping. You're like, can I just fucking get, can I just like get a platform to breathe for a second? The basic principle here is the, the credit card bill idea is like, if you watch movies such as Scarface where He's just on top of the fucking world. The next thing you know, he just gets shot up. Or the idea of, say, Pablo Escobar or the movie Goodfellas or Casino. You see this meteoric rise and then boom. And so you've kind of described the rise yeah. and then boom. And then how would you... So it's kind of like the rise like fixation. Yeah. Well... And, the boom. and I can discuss that because I've been there too and I got pulled in it as well. So I've been in that orbit too. Yeah, the boom's the, the second time that really stands out going to hell. And that's why I went to the depths of it. Um, cause, cause even before that, like you'd come to me and you're like, you know, maybe you should do this. Like read, like, I remember you just like think more long term. Like what about books and you know, stuff like, I'm like, fuck that <laughs> validation. I don't need that shit. In like I was so years, stubborn. I would never have seen you doing a channel like this or doing book reviews. This yeah. is like beyond my wildest dreams. Well, dude, I, I even say like, you would have come to me before the scandal and you're like, oh, spirituality or even like power of now. And I'm like whatever like that mm. like spirituality poof, like I'd spit on it like I was mm. so stubborn like yeah, I tried to get you I'm, meditation yeah mm. it's like there was zero willingness I you drag me and I'm like okay I'll do it and the whole time there I'm like fuck this duh, duh, duh. okay tinder. Like, yeah, yeah tinder like more validation um until the, there there was like the bill to pay uh. you know as you said like everything came crumbling down with the scandal I see some comments from various people here about a fella called Julian Blanc Julian Blanc Julian no, Blanc Julian Blanc. Julian Blanc Julian Blanc Julian Blanc you know who Julian Blanc yes. Blanc in that seek for validation I was like how can I get more validation just shock humor and I started just putting really inappropriate things out just to get crazy reactions let's also be clear like because again you're, you're being hard on yourself so I've got to like stick up for you here the, su the stuff that you're putting out was inappropriate but Everyone's laughing. Yeah. I, I, sometimes I think people forget that it's funny. It's not like you're just like, eh, 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 eh. like, and the thing you got in trouble for, particularly, was a fake Twitter account, yeah. a lowercase J or higher case J or whatever they did, and they made you like say all this crazy stuff, and then the, the fake news basically just promoted that as news. So, what, so I want to be clear here that um, what was reported was bullshit, but he was still being a dick. So he's willing to. You're basically willing to own it yeah. for the fact that you're like, I'm going to own that karma even if this was like exaggerated or taken out of context and then some parts of it was real and then that part you own it. Mm -hmm. So so the, I, I do want to be clear here. Like it wasn't like you were all fucking crazy. You're a nice guy, but like all people, there's a vice. Everybody has their vice and that was just your vice and you're, you're choosing to own it. Mm -hmm. yeah, actually, it didn't make sense to me at all because I used to watch a lot of your old content and I was in the first row at that seminar mm. for which you got in trouble for and I met you after the free tour and I was like, uh, hi, this is um, Evie, I would like to work for you. And you were like actually a really nice guy. I'm like, it doesn't make sense. On yeah. camera, he's being so obnoxious, but in real life, he's like, I'm Julian, hi. Like, I can't even make a, like, he's a really nice, uh, nice guy. And I'm like, it doesn't make sense to me at all. What's going on here? Like the really obnoxious. Yes. Well, you're, you're, a nice, you're a nice guy with a vice, 
that also not only are guys all laughing and cheering on, but every girl in, in Los Angeles is trying to jump on you too. Yeah. So it's kind of hard to, you know, and, and that's kind of what's taken out of context. Mm -hmm. So that, you know, but then again, the crash out, and I'd be happy to share on that too. And I'll, I mean, you know, mm. I mean, I'll give a little bit of my take on it was, uh, you know, you had this uh, video that you made and, um, you know, I remember thinking it was, it was a bad idea to put out that video, but I just thought, well, whatever, you know, people are just kind of laughing, whatever. And then, um, and then, and I think it had about 80,000 views. So people keep coming to me and they they keep saying, oh, and that, uh, that, uh, Julian, uh, Asian video is just getting, and it was it, an old video. It was out for a year. And it, it had been out for quite a while. And so people, so people kept saying that it's going viral. So I'd go look and it was like 82,000. And then I'm walking down the street. People are coming up to me in the street. Like, dude, that shit's blowing up. I'm like, it's like 83,000 something like that and um so i'm like well i don't know whatever and then i find out what they've done is they've selectively cut it to make it worse intentionally for what's called optics if you study uh media you can read a uh, glass jaw by eric desenhall if you really want to understand the the, the julian gate media scandal read glass jaw by eric desenhall glass jaw by eric desenhall that's and, uh, and, that's a good layout and trust me i'm lying by ryan Holiday. yeah trust me i'm lying ryan holiday who did a collab with you after which i thought was really cool of him a couple of them yeah, really cool of them. So, what up, Ryan? Really cool guy. Yeah, very awesome. <laughs> okay, so, um, <laughs> sorry, I got like, really cool I'm like, I'm like, I fell on my love my level. Edit. Okay, so then now from there, um, um, I, I stumble on. So now from there, I stumble onto the real video, and I'm like, oh, fuck. And here we go. Now, the problem was, I feel like no other company would fuck it up like we did because we're so determined. So when they're like, you're not gonna run a, a seminar in, in Australia. We're like, we're running our seminar. This is bullshit. We're, this isn't getting stopped. And, it, and we, we gave them every optic in the book to make it look so crazy, right? So we're like, we're not gonna, we're not gonna go all the way across the world to run a seminar and then have them stop it based on some doctored fucking video. Fuck that, we're running our seminar. So then we try to run it like in a park and then they block that. Then we try to run it in all these different hotels. They call the different hotels to get it stopped. And then finally, we're like, we'll run it on a boat. So in our mind, like everyone on the, here's what's funny in the world, okay? Everybody always thinks they're on the right side of history, right? So the people that are watching, most people don't know what fake news is. They don't know what clickbait is. They don't know what selective cutting is. And so they're seeing your video and they're like, clearly this is fucked up. The average person also, also doesn't understand that for many, many years, legacy media was trying to put out somewhat real stories, but legacy media has evolved to being a lot of clickbait. There's so, and by the way, people say like are always ripping the mainstream media. There's also great stuff on the mainstream media. I think by saying all mainstream media is bad, that's like people who like discount our stuff and, and clump us in. There's a lot of great mainstream media, but there is an element of mainstream media that has become clickbait. And anybody that denies that is really dumb, very naive at least. So that being the case, what happened was the average person doesn't know that like media does selective cutting and clickbait. They see this, they're like, well, it's in a mainstream media thing. Surely they vetted it. It must be vetted before they put that in there. So they see you, so they're like, okay, we gotta stop this guy. So in their mind, they're trying to do something really beautiful and powerful and, and helping the world, but they just assume that the mainstream media is accurate. Now, from our perspective, we're like, the mainstream media is not being accurate. These are customers of ours. These are people who want to learn. We're there to teach them. We went across the world to teach them. We're not letting them shut us down. So we make the stupid decision that we're gonna run this thing on a boat. Now, how much more can you feed into like the bad guys Sounds doing good. it on the evil boat? Like how much more awesome clickbait are you just handing them <laughs> to do that? Now, I'm equally dumb because then Max, who's down there, is like, is like what, should, what should I do about this? Because they came to swarm the boat. And I'm like, listen, man, this is just a miscommunication. You should just go talk to them. And when you go and talk to them and let them know that this is a big misunderstanding, it'll be cool. Next thing you know, he's getting slapped. <laughs> What the fuck? Like, am I, like, and what's funny is, like, you can't even talk, like, like, are we making this up? Is this fucking real life? So what's happening is now we're entering into the hell realm. The karmic debt is coming. And we literally watch as the company is dismantled. Clients, customers, students loving us, like, don't worry about it, guys. We know this is bullshit, da, da, da. But countries, banks, websites, ability to fly even, like anything is just getting shut. Sh like 
on a level that we, we, we don't even go into this, okay? We don't go into this. That's why it's so funny. People are like, why did, like, why do you go on CNN to like get the, get the students to still like him? We already still liked him. It's like, that wasn't for the students <laughs> at all. That was for countries to make it clear, this is a misunderstanding and any part that, that was yeah. real, we own it and stop. Not, not cool, own it, we're done. So that being the case, that's what happened. Now, as we go into the hell realm, I, I'd like to get you to describe a little bit about the hell realm, okay? And I would describe my take on it, too. As soon as shit started blowing up on Australia, and I remember it was like, Nick called me, he's like, first flight out now, and I had to rush to the airport to leave because shit was getting way too dangerous. And uh, you, would have, you, would have, you were being pursued globally. Oh, yeah. Think no, of I, it, I think walk- of your worst nightmare, the world wanting you fucking dead. You were in the, this newspaper, this newspaper, this newspaper, full page articles. Oh, uh, gotcha. So now you have to leave the country? Yeah. I'd walk out in the street and there was like my face everywhere. Like you'd walk past the fucking like newspaper stand, the, the little thing where you put the, it was like the post office, not the post office, the uh, postal boxes. My name, my face, my name. It's like, find this guy. Like a rat. Yeah, it's like, so Kill I was like, the rat. so I literally had to walk out like disguised like that. And there's like first flight out. And the whole time on the flight, everything's just blowing up. And uh, then it just went to shit. Like I had to go into hiding because there were like death threats on me. Um, you know, someone we know, like, they got a letter with, like, fake anthrax in it. Uh, I got calls from, like, the lawyers, like, only use cash, don't use your card, you could be tracked, da 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 there's money on your head. How about this? Many of our closest friends going into the media to trash you oh, yeah. or to trash me, people that we think are our friends, using it to get press. Mm-hmm. Your friends, the people that are supposed to have your fucking back. Yeah, yeah, like, friends doing that. Um, just the, the whole world doing that too. Like, as I said, if I didn't know me and I read what was being said about me, I'd hate me too. But at the time it fucks with you. You're like, am I really the, a, that bad of a person? Yeah, should I kill um, myself? Yeah, yeah. And then it's like, um, I remember like meeting before going on CNN, like different PR firms. And there was like one where the guy just looked at me like I was the worst ever. Like he wanted to kill me, Hillary like trembling. PR firm, right? Yeah, Hillary Clinton's mm-hmm. PR firm. We meet the guy and he's like, I can't believe I, I like we shake his hand. And he's like, I'm like, Julian, he shakes my hand. He's like, wait a minute, what's your name? I'm like, Julian. And he looks at me like I'm the devil. He's like, I regret shaking your hand. Like straight up and starts tearing up because he gets so mad. And he's like, my wife told me not to even take this meeting. I hate you, draw Like that, I'm like, dude, you know, it's not real. It's like, far. Like, I was like, wow. It's like, I've never been viewed as like such scum ever before. And then it just gets worse. Like, um, yeah, all the PR firms, there's like back end things with merchant accounts. It's like costing so much money. So it's like- but if you're running a $10 million a year business, your run rate, because most businesses don't have a ton of profit, and your run rate is about, a mil, is about a mil a month, well, what's happening? You're going into debt about a mil a month. If you can't even run a seminar in a hotel, if you can't even do a product launch and get that money through a merchant, you are being choked to death while debt is racking up. Yeah, so it reaches that Let point where it's like- get into a country. Yeah, so like everyone hates you. Um, you can't put videos out anymore. You can't do seminars because, like, again, the hotels will shut you down because people just swarm. There's marches everywhere, protests everywhere. You're being um, actively hunted. Yeah, like government sending in things, um, quoting a fake Twitter account. You're like, what? The government doesn't even look into this? They don't give um, a fuck. Yeah, it's, it's like clear. friends saying, too, it's like your name's being passed around, like, at the FBI. I'm like, what? It's like they just view you as a joke, but if it escalates, they'll have to shut you down. So it's like everything's exploding. I'm in hiding. I'm like... What do I do? And just like completely lost. And um, yeah, it's like the bill was paid. Mm-hmm. And then after that, like the, the worst moment, which funny enough was actually the most enlightening moment, was a couple months after that, like we were at Miami Summit, and that's where it was like everything on the surface was kind of starting to be patched up together. Mm-hmm. And that's usually when it gets the worst. Because during that time, it was going to hell, but I was like, my, my mind was like, stay focused, get through this. It's like survive, survive, like kind of barrel through, survive. And then as soon as it stabilizes a bit, that's when you're finally, you know, allowed to process all the stuff you've been like suppressing down there. So that's when, you know, it's weird because people, that's when people stop saying, are you okay? Because during it's like, are you okay? And you're like, yeah, I'm barreling through. And then after it's like, oh, he's okay now. It's like, it's over, it's getting better, but that's when it actually hits you. And then it's like, oh fuck, like all that stuff starts coming up. And I remember, yeah, in Miami, Um, Yeah, you mentioned like suicide, like I was so fucking close. Like that was a time there was like massive thoughts. And I remember it was like on the beach and it's just like, walk out in the water, don't come back, walk it. And it was like, what the fuck? Like, I I keep saying to this day, I was so lucky at that moment. I was like, I caught that voice. I'm like, what the fuck is this? And finally, like just let go of all those things I kept trying to find myself in, all the validation that was taken away. Because you have a choice. It'll drag you all the way down until you're done. 
or drag you all the way down until you perhaps let go. And uh, that was like my my glimpse out of hell. But it, it was from the very fucking bottom there. It was it was crazy. Like I remember like even before Miami, like there was one night too. It was like uh, we were out with some friends having a blast. And then I just came home and I was like, that was a great night. And then out of the blue, I, I just like fell to the ground, like breaking out in tears. I've actually never put this up. Okay, it's crazy. And I was like, what the fuck? And it was like all that stuff that you just keep putting down, like, you know, beating yourself up for things you did, hating yourself. It's like, why did I ever do that? It's, it's insane. Um, so yeah, it was like, that was like my, my lowest moment ever, but also the most enlightening one. Cause that's when I finally just let go. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. I can say from my side of it, I come from a culture where you, you stick with your crew hardcore. So I remember the first thing I said to you is I'm like, I knew what was about to happen, but you didn't fully know what's going to happen. So, and I said to you, I'm like, I won't throw you under the bus on this. I won't. Um, you know, stop my relationship with you no matter what. And you're like, no, no. And I think you didn't fully process like what I was saying. And I kept repeating this to you again and again, because I knew that you were going to realize soon what was happening. And um, in retrospect, though, it actually might've been a smarter move to say uh, uh, fired um, because I uh, could have saved a lot of that trouble. <laughs> you know, like probably should have, but uh, probably <laughs> fucked you over. <laughs> So not only am I so fucking stupid, you don't do the firing thing, but then I'm so fucking stupid, you do the boat thing. So that was my role in triggering a lot of this. Just like this raw, like, like I think we're the only crew of people like so fucking stupid to like do, like to respond to it in that way. It's just very unusual. So, you know, I like, I think a lot of people don't even put into context a business this size where we still clown like idiots publicly. You'd rarely see a business this side where we're just clowning, being morons, saying things that get cut out of context. Normally, well, that's how we hold the conspiracy together. <laughs> yeah, right. Like, oh, yeah. So we, me and him, joke about the the psych division in Laguna that's running the whole conspiracy. But anyway, so the <laughs> right, like as joke, I, like that would be great if there was. So, but then, but then, even in saying that, they're like, look up the Laguna. They, we got them. So <laughs> we got a yeah. little bit of information. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so what you had there, like, it's very, like, you, when you're watching this at home, you, you don't understand. Most businesses, the size of all our companies together and our business here, w they would never swear or joke or say things that could be open to misinterpretation because they know that's a huge litigation risk. We just keep doing it. Probably stupid. I mean, clearly stupid. But we just, that's just how we've chosen to live our lives. You know, you, you kind of, that's what we're rolling with. From there, though, what I'm experiencing is essentially what I call an unknown. It's this unknown terror. And you're watching something that you built for 15 years, putting everything that you have into it. And you're seeing how that's clearly like the basically last 15 years, not only like amounted to shit, but essentially you're going to, they're going to be taken away and you're going to be left in a hole of millions, probably never dig out and, and publicly ruined and probably never be able to get a job. So I'm looking at that. I'm looking at your situation. I know that you could, I know you're a suicide risk. Um, I know that um, every, and what you're going to see in the situation is that everybody on the team who's not really down, they're going to leave and they're going to shit talk when they leave. That's 100%. There's also um, um, effects of that years later where, pro because again, you know, when we can't even get at money, um, you know, for a long time, that creates issues with people who, you know, wind up later leaving, even if it takes years later and you're begging them to stay and it creates drama, you've probably seen some of that in the public. So there's essentially all these kind of, it's like all your structures being like ripped apart. It's almost like you have Rome and then the Germanic tribes are just ripping it to shreds. Like the tribes are coming. So, I'm seeing that happening and just knowing like um, everything from suicide risk, uh, every, every risk in the book is, is coming. Now, in my case, you know, then they start to come for me and they're looking for anything they, they can misquote. So essentially what they're doing is it's called a witch hunt. Okay, the word for this is a witch hunt. So they're looking for anything they can cut out of context or anything that they can do to, um, to, uh, to, to basically bullshit, to just ruin you, right? So they start to come after me. And I remember as they're coming after me now, um, they, you know, they got me pretty good. They were able to cut things out of context, get me pretty good. It never really gathered steam, but I just remember at the time, I'd never felt like that before. And um, uh, I remember, um, I'd been in depression many times in my life because I grew up in depression. So I grew up in a hell, in a hell realm growing up my first 20 years before I even knew social dynamics in this kind of like autistic haze. So I'd seen all that, I've been there, right? But this was like a different type of hell that I went into. And I felt myself going into deep apathy and really wishing, you know, for my own death to some extent, I could hear the voices, same thing as you in Miami. And what happened to me was that my mind, so, you know, I'd done a lot of inner growth work and my mind was like fighting back 
So I remember being at the gym, and I've had what in spiritual growth, they'll call that a Satori experience. Satori experience is where you become so present to the moment that you can't even hear your inner thoughts anymore. You're just super present, you feel great. So I'm going through this, and I go, I go whoa, down like that, and then my mind like recalibrates and like reboots and goes poof, back like this. Now, a Satori experience, what's happening is, it's like if that's hell on earth, this is like heaven on earth. And, you're, and here's what's weird. It's like you became an angel, almost like you're dead, looking at all the people that are, still have their like worldly concerns. And I think a lot of people who take hallucinogenic drugs report feel like this, that's kind of funny. So basically what happens is, uh, or like say uh, ayahuasca or DM, DMT trip, they see the worst of the best. So what happened is like, I'm looking at people, my mind is silent, I'm in this like, I kind of jargon way to describe it would be like, say, like a meditative state. And I can see in their pupils the types of concerns they have. Not like the exact data, you're not like a psychic at all, obviously, but you can, you're like, oh, there's something hurting you. You don't know it's all gonna be okay. Oh, look at you. You don't know it's all gonna be okay. Now, when you do say like programs like TM and you raise the energy level in the room, people have that same realization. But that's getting like, say, thrust on me because boom, boom, like that. And then in that moment, I realize it's all okay. Even no matter what happens here, it's completely okay. And then I'm like, but I bet you, I bet you I'm probably gonna sink back really bad soon. So I gotta remember this. I'm like, this is a message, right? Like someone sending me a message. I'm like, I gotta remember this because she's gonna get super fucked. So I'm like, I must remember this. I must, I must, I must. Now what happened- like you have to write a message on the wall when you go back in time. To, yes. To, to remember the thing. Yeah, that's what it was like. Now what, what also happened in my case, so while this happened to you in, in parallel, there was a girl who I was with who had uh, diabetes. Now diabetes is often correlated with schizophrenia. This girl's stunningly beautiful, amazing girl. I love her to death. To me, she's like an angel. But what happened was, her diabetes was continually pounding on her psychologically. And she started to exhibit these signs of, of borderline personality disorder. A lot of bad things that I did, I, I would change many of my behavior. I, I feel bad for tons of things I did. But at the same time, this is just another thing that's also happening is what she's dealing with. I watched her during this time completely melt down, melt down into the most demonic, deranged behavior. She's, she's act, so while this is happening with you, she's screaming on the bed, She's rolling around, she's accusatory. Sometimes I'm just sitting there and like the lights go out and I look up and she's like, punch me and like all this crazy stuff. I haven't talked about this in, in vid so much because uh, you know, I want to put some distance between it. So now you saw her and you saw, and she's a friend of yours and you saw what's going on and you're like, dude, you got to get the fuck out of here. Like what's happening? So it was almost like this like demented demonic cloud is descending on the company. You know, the love of my life at that time is like punching me going into borderline personality disorder. We have some other videos coming out about these topics. You're, you're a potential suicide risk. All the people who we've built up relationships with, you know that like, it's like a game of whack-a-mole where you're like, you're trying to keep them from leaving and to see the vision going forward. Now, the, the, the cool part of it was a lot of people who know that we're a strong team and that we're just down for a minute, knew that, um, knew that if they befriended us during that time that they'd kind of get some clout with us on the way up. Smart move. People are such prisoners of the moment. It's so crazy. They see you down for a minute. They're like, eh, they go against you. And it's like, yo, that's not the best move. If that person bounces back, if anything, that's the time to double down and help them while they're down. That's actually a super smart, practical tip you could take from this right there. But anyway, so I'm going through that. Now, watching her going to her low vibration energy and just go boom like this, and I could make 30 hours of video on, on what I saw with her. It's insane and what I learned. You can read uh, the book, um, if you ever have a girlfriend or, or a partner uh, who's going through this, read the book, Stop Walking on Eggshells, and I Hate You, Please Don't Leave, or I Hate You, Don't Leave. Um, these are books on borderline personality disorder. These can literally save your life. Very common that uh, the spouse of someone with BPD commits suicide, by the way, because the negative energy has a direct grip on the person, and then they put that on the other person. It's super crazy. Like, a buddy of mine's dating a girl who has BPD, and, um, they, and uh, I saw that was going on. I reached out to him. And I was like, hey man, the reason I'm reaching out to you is in case you were to, um, you know, sometimes people with a BPD uh, relationship that commit suicide. And I, I thought that he would think I'm a weirdo, right? Like I thought he's gonna think like I'm being super weird. He texts me back, he's like, oh, her last boyfriend commit suicide. Like this shit is common, common, common. And people aren't talking about it. Like BPD partners, their partner will kill themselves sometimes. So what's happening is, is the person with borderline has a direct hijacking of hell energy in them. And it goes and fucking, puts it on the person, they wind up killing themselves. It's super crazy. If you, if you ask a room of people, a lot of people have had uh, partners like this, it gets crazy. So I'm going through that, and I'm literally watching as every, all these different assets that we built are just being crushed and crushed. You're being hunted, reputational. Like, like, it's just 
falling apart. I'm waking up in the middle of the night. My fucking head is spinning. I, it's just like this living fucking hell. You're living, you're, you're in a state of terror, depression, apathy, b- suicide risk, and it just keeps going and going and going. That feeling of hunted too, you're right. It's like people's fear is like, oh man, I'm walking down the street. I feel like people are staring at me. It's like, that was literally it. Like you're walking out that front door and you're like cap down, hoodie and shit. Like, oh my God. That should really God. happen to you. Yeah. That's the most people. It's like they're actually dream. hunting me. And there was uh, in, in New York, remember, it's like we went to to the bank and this was like, I think a couple of days before the, the CNN interview. And we're at the bank and I'm there and Nick's there. And so Nick's like, I think those people recognize you. And there's like two people who keep staring at me. And then we walk a bit and they follow. And we literally had to sprint like four blocks in New York to ditch these people. And we're like, mm-hmm. it, it, to be fair, they we're could sitting, have been, sitting in the fucking yeah, they could have been you're fans. On the, you're on the fucking, uh, but they, yeah. Mm-hmm. But yeah, you never know. And yeah, it's like you're on TV. You're like, fuck, fuck, fuck. Like, yeah, full on hunted. Like the world's out to get you. So this isn't something that we're just telling as a story. This is something that we're trying to relate to you and how it relates to your own life. We've talked about this idea of feeling hunted. And the idea of feeling in hell, despair, despondence, hopelessness. I was familiar with this and what you were going to experience because I've been in the book The Game by Neil Strauss, mm-hmm. where it's about a 400-page book and the back half of it was just um, pulling us apart and me, me uh, not us, I mean it was me, right? And, and all the community. And, um, you know, me as, as a younger guy experiencing that and really not even able to walk down the street after the book The Game came out without expecting some guy to come up and do something horrible, you know, living in complete and utter fear and uh, and going through that. And it's amazing. It makes you very mentally tough. I mean, it turns you in a tough motherfucker to the point where your mind kind of just recalibrates and you move on. But I think what we're sort of relaying here is this idea that, like, you think about hell? Well, yeah. Hell can be on Earth. Imagine what hell would look like, right? Like, say, uh, Dante's Inferno, the, the book, has an example, where people are sitting and just kind of sitting around just burning, screaming. Sit, and, and I almost imagine it like levels of hell, like in Dante's Inferno, right? Like, at one level, it's like, oh, you know, you're, you're a victim. Like, oh, these people fuck me over. They don't respect me. I, like, that's actually how I imagine hell. Like, people literally, like, this is a mind fuck. Take this as a mind fuck. You know, because this, this is a what if video. What if hell was on Earth? I imagine hell, if there was levels of hell, people just sitting there like, this person disrespected me. I didn't get the respect I deserve. I didn't get the respect I deserve. I didn't get the respect I deserve. You know, I got fucked over. I'm a victim. I'm a victim. I'm a victim. Or like, you know, what you went through or what I've been through. Like, they're out to get me. They're out to get me. I need that girl. I need that guy. I need that partner. I need that promotion. I need that thing. Mm-hmm. Da, da, da. Yeah. yeah, I mean, as I we've seen. It. I need it. You know, I need as it. we've seen in, in learning how to interact and to create a crazy draw towards you. And when you see someone who you're, who you're dating get obsessed with you. And, and seeing that the more that you become distanced, the more that they lock in on that and, and chase it. And it's insane. Um, now, you can, you can see this even in, say, homeless people, where they're, they're sitting there in a, uh, you know, a street corner, say, under here or whatever, and they're fighting over a tin can or a piece of crack or, or, or like a, a piece of, like, like a, a paper box to sleep in or something. This incredible scarcity, not enough resources, density, pain, and anything to escape it. And this is a very, very deep topic, one that I'm sure we'll make many, many, many videos on. But you're getting this idea of hell. And like we mentioned at the start of the video, everybody who's sitting here has been there. The first time, I felt like I was on top of the world. I felt like like I, I put a, a bunch of different things in place with, with having a girlfriend who was the most perfect girlfriend who would have threesomes with me to that, like, like regularly, consistently, to then having my business be extremely residual. I had everything going, it, it was very scalable, it was residual, I was young. Everyone kind of looked at me as like this like young whiz kid. They always looked at me as I was so successful for my age. And then like a couple things happened. I got just a little bit older, and then things started to kind of go awry with the girl. She started, she started partying a little bit harder and kind of bringing me into this party lifestyle. I kind of made excuses for it because it was a lot of this quick validation. It was, it was like her and I together were doing the things that you were talking about doing with the puppeteer, right? And we, it was like, almost like we were, um, it, it was like we was joining us together every time that we would do it. And then I remember I would had, I had these, I had this perfect business partner. I had perfect clients. Everything just had, this, was this perfect world. And I kind of felt almost like things were 
on one hand, too good to be true. But then on the other hand, I was thinking, well, what did I do to create these things? Well, one is, it seemed very positive. But what, what did I do? Well, I, I, I kind of did a bunch of things that, I wouldn't say I regret, but a bunch of things that gave me that, that initial credit card type transactional thing that I had to, that the, the payoff had to happen later. Well, one, I, I based my entire validation, my entire self-esteem on how many new girls I could sleep with. And then on top of that, it was, well, how many, how many people lo- like look at me as being good with game or good with people in general? Every single thing that I based my confidence on was external. It was something that was, it was very external. And then it got to a point where I kept, like, within a very short period of time, I was thinking, well, what if, what if this girl leaves me? Well, then all of my success with women is kind of based on having this, like, wing woman here almost, right? It's like, have I forgotten how to do this without having her there? It was a super depressing moment because I got into, I got into learning how to become better with people because I was depressed. I was on Prozac. I was on antidepressants um, from an experience that was another hell on earth kind of situation from when I was younger. So I used this thing we call game to really relieve some of that pressure. But, and it worked for years. It worked really, really well. But then I, I kind of aligned myself with people, though. And I didn't realize this at the time, but I aligned myself with business partners and friends that were actually borderline sociopathic, borderline BPD, as you mentioned. I didn't know what it was at the time. Dark tried. Yeah, and I, it was funny because we'd actually talked about this before the video, and it, I hadn't cried in maybe four years. I hadn't felt bad in four years. I was like, yo, my life is perfect. I was making tens of thousands of dollars of, uh, uh, per month at like 23 years old, doing exactly what I want to be doing, dating more than what I thought would be the perfect girl, introducing me to girls that were even more attractive. Everything, I was on top of the world. But then all of a sudden, the things that I liked about the people around me started turning inward towards me. So for example, the, the things that I, I liked about my business partner, well, he was being very, very nasty to other people. And I thought it was kind of funny and just kind of in the nature of business. But then he started doing them to me. He started um, stealing from me. He started belittling me. It was, it was, like, it was almost like this thing that, it was like this massive breaking of trust that I didn't realize could ever happen. And, and probably a third of my entire self-esteem was based on my relationship with him and what we'd achieved. And then all of a sudden it was being taken away from me in this way that I was like, this doesn't have to happen this way. But it was almost like I was getting punished for rewarding his negative behavior towards other people. So again, whether it's a karma thing or not, the pendulum was starting to shift. And then I was losing kind of a grip on reality a little bit. So what I started to do is I started drinking really hard with, with the girl that I was with because we started not dating as many other girls. And then when we weren't dating as many other girls, well, all of a sudden, my self-esteem was going out the door with those girls. So I was like, well, wait, I'm only kind of in this relationship because of what seemed like a positive thing of us meeting more girls, but then it ended up being a negative thing. So then I started drinking really hard. We started partying really hard. Um, and then I kind of filled that gap with then overcompensating and going really far the other way. So for example, um, where it all kind of came to a head is um, I got a DUI in Miami on a boat. And it was, what was really crazy about it is I only went to Miami because I needed to fulfill these things that was fucking up. So I needed to, I needed to try to get a bunch of clients really quickly. I needed to try to kind of fix my self-esteem there. I needed to get a bunch of girls really quickly. And then the way I was able to, well, bad way that I tried to do it is hang out with some people that were, um, they were doing a lot of illegal things. They were doing a lot of really, they're putting me in actual physical danger. And I, I, I needed to feel on top of the world again so much that even though I knew that this was going to be bad, I still put myself in that situation because I, I longed for those feelings so much of being on top of the world. So then I, I, I put myself in a situation where people were, were doing illegal things. They were, they, were, they were around other even more shady people. But then in order to kind of fix everything, I, I just, I kind of went crazy and tried to pull all these girls into my life very quickly. I drank a lot very quickly. And I tried to impress a bunch of people that I didn't really care very quickly. And it all basically came into this moment where um, I, I got, I got uh, arrested in Miami. And I remember just as it was happening, I just see the people walking away. I see, Gosh, I see like my girlfriend walking away, mad at me for us hooking up with these girls. That was the, it was about to be the most perfect day in the world. I was about to make all this money. I was about to then have this foursome on ecstasy with the most beautiful girls I've ever seen. And instead, I'm sitting there in handcuffs looking at this cop, him just shaking his head at me. And the guy friend that I was with ran. The, my girlfriend at the time, she walked away and just shook her head. 
the girls that we were with, of course. Literally, the guy that I was with ended up hooking up with two of the girls that was there. And, I, and like, I would, the whole time, I was like, oh, the only reason he was there, the, I, was, I was working so hard to impress this guy who I thought would help me business-wise, only to then watch him, well, I didn't watch him because I was sitting in a jail cell in Miami, but watch him understand that he ended up fucking those two girls. So I ended up getting put in this, this like, tank kind of thing of a vehicle. And I'm in the city in there, and there's this guy next to me who's got blood on himself, spitting on me. And I'm just, I'm just sitting there. We're, we're like crammed together. And I'm sitting here being like, is this what my life has like become? Like two weeks ago, I had this amazing girlfriend. I was living in a mansion with, with a friend for a business partner. We were like literally making plans to crush the world, um, coaching pickup at the time. And then all of a sudden I was like, oh, like one bad decision kind of fucked it all up. But in reality, looking back at it, I was like, how many bad, de- like, how many bad decisions did I make to reclaim an e- a position of ego? It wasn't even like I was actually reclaiming anything tangible. I was re- trying to reclaim a feeling that I had gotten. I'm sitting there crying my eyes out in this drunk tank van kind of thing. I'm sitting there being like, this guy has blood on himself. They just throw everyone who got arrested in the past couple hours into one vehicle. I find out later in jail that, he's, that he just killed uh, someone with a knife and he was sitting there with me. And I'm like, yo, all I did was try to impress some girls by being in South Beach. Like, mm-hmm. I don't belong here. But then it took so long for them to bail me out of jail that what ended up happening is they handed me this. I remember being in jail being like, well, I don't belong here. I'm waiting, you know, I'm going to get bailed. And then it's like in the movies. They, they give the money and then you leave right away. Little did I know that you, there's a minimum eight-hour hold on people who are arrested. And so I'm, I'm like, wait, this isn't me. But then they moved you. And then this is where it got really scary is, and I really contemplated all this stuff. I was, uh, I was, I was held, um, I, they gave me a bar of soap and, um, and an outfit, right? And I was like, no, no, I don't think you understand. I'm not staying here. <laughs> this isn't, I'm leaving. I have friends. And then lo and behold, nobody that I was with bailed me out of jail. No one that I was with helped at all. Instead, I'm just like, like rotting in this jail cell. And then they move us. And I was thinking like, wait, am I going to be here forever? I was, I was looking at the door being like, who knows that I'm even here like, this is, this is not me. Like, this is crazy. I'm like, oh, this, is, this is silly. Like, I was, uh, I was on a boat. Like, how did this happen? Like, I'm not, I don't, even, I don't even like alcohol. I don't even like the people I was with. How did I let myself get sucked into this? All because I was chasing this ego, like this feeling. It was crazy. This was the first time that I really felt this hell on earth thing. The, the fickle friends thing is crazy, too. It's a common theme when, in the downfall. The craziest part is, the craziest part is, when it was all done... They were, they, they were like, yeah, it was so epic, right? Let's do it again. And I was like, no, I'm, I'm good right now. It was, it was nuts. But then I remember, okay, finally one of my friends, he, you know, they called up, oh, you know, Luke, you're ready to go. Someone bailed you out. And then as I leave, I'm sitting there being like, I'm in the middle of like North Miami, an hour away from where I was. There was I had no money on me. I had no cell phone. I'm just sitting there being like, well, what do I do now? Like, this, is this what the chase of my ego was all for, just like literally sitting here. I was like, what do, I'm like, what do normal people do? Like I have a, I can walk to a place, I guess, but I'm just like, I, I see how it just becomes, I, 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 there was a clear, a very clear choice. I was like, oh, like what do most people do here? If they don't have an out, they just go lower. And I see how easy it would have been to go lower and lower and lower because who were the people that were around me? People that were doing even way worse things. People that were, that were uh, trained in uh, illegal activities from just being out of that jail situation, literally standing right next to me. I could have easily made friends with the people that kind of honestly were more of a friend in the moment than who my friends were. I can see how it just t- pulls you down and pulls you down even further. And I'm sitting there, I'm just like waiting for the bus. And I'm, I, I was just sitting there, I was like, my eyes were welling up. I started to, to freak out a little bit being like, what do I do now? This is what, I, this is what I've based my whole existence on. And, uh, and now it's being taken away entirely. So I literally like kind of hitchhiked a little bit, right? That didn't really work because I don't really know how to do that. And eventually I like, I got on this bus and just kept finding my way down to where I was supposed to be. And it made me like contemplate everything. It made me contemplate this girl, it made me contemplate alcohol and substances. And then it made me contemplate a lot of this. And um, it, was a, it was a really weird situation. If you get into a low vibration energy circuit with that girl, with this like awesome girl, it's so hard to leave because the more that you fight, the more that you want to rationalize that the fight had a purpose, which is for you two to maybe come closer or to get through it together. You don't want to just kind of give up after you like been to the been to the fucking hell and back together in this fight that you're having. And then if you're involving alcohol or drugs or partying, um, you're kind of inviting the demons in even more. And then that channel's going even uh, more and more 
And I, I think it's especially hard too if, um, I mean, I think one of the things that I've seen a lot of guys gets them involved in like, like drugs and stuff, which lets in a lot of this energy, is um, is the sex thing. Because if you have like, like I'm sorry, but how many men in the world, if you have like five Playboy Playmate type girls that want to have a big orgy and they just want you to do like a line of blow or something, like there's like, I've never done blow myself, but like there's not a ton of guys that are going to say no to that. I mean, like I'm also, I'm also, I'm also, I'm almost mean, embarrassed I that I wouldn't do that, you know? And it's, it's virtually impossible to say no, but I mean, look at some of the guys who we know who, do run incredible social circles and get laid a lot. But like, I mean, I've seen it where like some of these guys that run these incredible social circles, they get, that get laid a lot. They, they bring over big groups of girls to my house and you can see that like, they're all doing Coke and stuff like that. And you can see how the Coke has like taken these beautiful young women and like pulled the life energy out of them. They have wrinkles in their face prematurely, wrinkles in their eyes. It's a good way um, to look at it because they actually prematurely. Looks, look sun sunken in. Yeah, and yet, they, but, but and yet they could use makeup. Right, and they can hide it to an extent, and it, and it, it almost like with some of them, and these are pretty nice guys, like that I've been polite to in, in person. So it's, I don't like enjoy saying this, but I'm just trying to give an example for a video here. Is it almost looks like it's Satan with like his like little group of like Satanettes, kind of like you know coming in in their limo, in their little like they're all kind of going down together, and they're they're like partying in hell, like like going down down like, and they're gonna enjoy it, but they're just making more and more. Uh, deal with the devil and I think a lot of people can get pulled into it so I remember seeing you in Chicago and you were all jacked up and you like got me in like these super awesome clubs and like this is before you ever be, before I knew you super well and like and like I was kind of like envious in one way because you were just like rock star I knew that you had this uh, this I, I had uh, the penthouse at the, Trump, the, Tower penthouse at the, weekend, at the yeah. Trump Tower yeah it was like it was as negative as it was it was kind of equally positive I remember that weekend exactly I remember me and you like I, I remember me and you would meet up accidentally in all these different cities yeah. and that's how you and I kind of became friends and I just remember thinking, it was funny because at the time I remember, so I, I never had a sip of alcohol until I was 23 years old, essentially, right? And, I, and it's because I don't really like that stuff at all. It, I just saw that, oh, I, for me, game was always about, oh, this guy's wearing a deep V-neck shirt. I'm not going to ask why. He's getting results with girls. I'm just going to try it. He's wearing a hat. I'm going to try it. Whatever the thing is, I'm going to try it. Well, unfortunately, like what you just mentioned, a lot of guys who are really good with women and having a lot of success also then have a lot of low vibrational activities in their life, right? And I remember I was in Chicago, and that weekend I had uh, I had two penthouses. I had the penthouse at the residence of the Trump Tower, and then my friend had the penthouse at the um, the hotel side. So we would party back and forth, and we had girls waiting for us. We had um, we, God, we just the whole city was. I mean, we had um, a couple of cars that uh, that he had rented. One was a friend of his that were just badass cars. The whole weekend was just insane, and it was kind of a culmination. I remember I I think I was there for three weeks, two and a half weeks, something. And I bumped into you. I was like, hey, I'm sure I can get us into this club. And I just grabbed you. You really did. Yeah, I'm like, and they're like, oh, who do you know? I'm like, I don't know anyone. I'll just talk my way in. <laughs> it was great. I was, and I remember I didn't have any. That's what's so funny about social circle versus cold approach or whatever it is. Like, I didn't know any of these people. I just grabbed you and I was like, mm. all right, let's make it happen. I don't even remember what I said at the time. It was just mm. a lot of like garbly gook. I'm sure. The first, so much. Out it's of probably nonsense. So much out of control confidence. You can't say no. It's like just this like tsunami that you brought to the door. Yeah, and I remember I remember I bumped into with you. I remember I was so excited because I bumped into this this Hispanic girl that <laughs> this Hispanic girl that I've been trying to game for a long time. And I bumped into you. You gave me a little bit of social proof. You were with a really pretty girl, and then she's stunning. So I grabbed all. I just kind of like pulled you all together and was yeah, like, "We're going inside." And in my mind, I was like, "I'm gonna do anything to get inside this club because I need to fuck with this girl." I literally felt like at that time I was a. It's, it's funny because we can actually get into a bigger video about this, but before I, when we, we me and you discussed me joining RSD, you were like, you just so you know, there's some, there's some issues with it as well. Don't think it's all, you know, there's a lot of work involved. And I said, I remember on the phone call with you, I don't know if you remember this call, but I like, I remember I had a, a bottle of Moet in one hand and like my shirt was like button buttoned to here. And I had six girls uh, like laying around me at a hotel room in New York. And I was, I remember I was just like, I'm ready to put the Moet bottle down. <laughs> I just remember. <laughs> I, I, was, I was drunk, I was high on Molly for weeks. I'm not even joking, you might, you might want to edit this out, but I remember, and this is a separate, this is a separate, this is even Chicago. I was in Manhattan at a penthouse at Gansevoort, and I didn't pay for any of it. I had friends that were literally just flying me around, and I just had six girls, all in state of undress, and I was, I was just like trying to remember if I had sex with one of them. I was like, did this count? Like, did I, and I remember just, and I was like, I, and I was so impressed with myself that I held the Moet bottle. It was still about, I only drank about half. And I woke up and I didn't spill any. In my mind, I was like, that's a good night. And then, 
And then you're, you and I are talking, and you're like, hey, you know, if you want to come back to Vegas, you know, I, I don't know, we're very, really big into personal development and bettering ourselves. And I just was thinking, and you're like, but it's a lot of hard work. And the whole time I'm thinking, I could use a little personal development right now. So earlier to the Chicago story, I scoop you guys up and I bring you in. I just remember, first thing I did, go to the bar, drink as much as possible. I saw that, right? yeah. I was and like, I, whoa. And because I had been trained earlier to be like, oh, the more you drink, the hotter girls you're going to get. Mm. And, I, and it was, it's obviously not necessarily true, but I had kind of like, I, the pendulum started to shift, essentially, right? And I, all of a sudden, I was like, and I remember seeing you in there. I remember later we talked, and you told me like what you saw of it. And you're like, well, on one hand, it was very impressive, but on the other hand, you're like, oh, this guy's a mess. Well, it's, a, it's a, you can see that you can see that the pendulum charge. It's like what happened with yourself. You see the pendulum charging up. So you're like, here we go. What's gonna happen? Let's and go. you're right about it getting it feeling like it's really good before it gets bad, because that night I remember the hangover I had the next day. But then it's not like I got the negative feedback. It's, it's like they say when you, um, when you train a dog to not piss on the ground. You know, you're supposed to kind of like take the dog and really show and rub its face kind of in the piss, right? That's how they, you train a dog not to pee on the ground. But what you can't do is when you come home from work, go rub the, the dog's face in it. It has to be an immediate connection. The conditioning has to be right away. But otherwise, they don't know and just, they just don't really make the connection. Well, for me, it was, I was never, the negative never happened after the negative thing that I did immediately. So I never made the connection until way later. That, it's like... It's almost like uh, the ch it's, instead of the credit card bill having to be paid, it's almost like the check has to be cashed. And there's this long period where you get to play with the thing you just bought with the check, but then when the check cashes, you're like, wait, is my savings account the way it's tied to my checking account? Is it, is it, is it going to cash, right? It was, it's an interesting way of looking at it. So I remember the next day, I, I spent another week partying at that Trump Tower spot, right? And I never knew how much that affected me. But what it did is, and I don't know if it's the, a demon thing, like what you talk about or what it is, but you definitely, at minimum... The more of these negative decisions you make, the more negative decisions you're willing to make. It's like, I, there's definitely like a, like a Swiss cheese that happens in your mind where you're willing to let negativity come in. Because that, that night where you saw me, nothing negative happened at all. It was nothing but amazing. I, I, I hooked up with that girl. Then we went up to the Trump time. It was just like, it was the, like the, the door guys at Trump were literally like, hello, Mr. Krogh, how are you today? And I'm just like, I'm good. <laughs> Hold my stuff. I'm good. And I was, and the whole time they're like, oh, uh, I see you have another female guest. Uh, is there anything you would want? And I'm like, be nice. I love her. I love her. Be nice to her. And she's the best. I love her. You, when you see her, you always let her up. It's amazing. Don't let her up at all. <laughs> Great recollection of this. I remember you, fully, right? Yeah. And, uh, and it was... <laughs> <laughs> and it was the world's greatest night. You remember what it was like. You remember seeing the, the benefits of it. But then at the same time, you were probably thinking, because you were a lot more uh, deeper in your personal development journey, you were probably also, probably kind of like what you said about Julian, where you can kind of, it's like you can almost see someone else's lower vibrational energy a lot better than they can. You know, it, it's, it's one of these things where if you're in it, you know, with you, with your breakup situation, with, with all of our situations, right, me with some of mine, you're the worst person to actually assess your own vibrational state almost. Because in your own mind, you're making the rationalizations. In my mind, I was like, I, everyone who was, um, who was trying to be, uh, get me thinking positively, I was like, you're just a hater. You're just jealous. You're envious of all of this. I was like, how, how, how are you gonna be, how are you gonna be hating when you can't even get in? I was like, what are you talking about? This is perfect. This is what we all tried to work so hard to build. And then um, it just, what it did is it actually uh, allowed me to make much worse decisions later. And this, this is what freed me up then to think, well, if I could get away with this, what else can I get away with? What else can I get away with? And that, to, to be fair, nothing negative happened from that night. Other, it was one of the best nights of my life. But what it did was it allowed my mind, I think, to be more perceptible to the negative energies that were coming in. And then that's where things started to go a little bit more negative, where I got arrested in Miami, and then um, I really kind of had to take, take stock of who in my life is actively trying to help me, uh, actually trying to help me, or who in my life is trying to encourage the bad behavior for their own good. Who in my life is trying to encourage the negative behavior, party with me to then judge it and then almost look at me like a laughing stock at my eventual kind of demise. I think the more positive emotions that you get from these negative experiences that you, that you think are going to kind of last, it's equal or exponentially worse when it hits you with that payload of negativity, right? 
So when I thought that I was on top of the world, really what, what was just about to happen was, was just this crashing wave of negativity. For example, how much lower can you get than me being sit, literally sitting next to someone who just stabbed someone to death and I'm sitting, he's spitting on me. I have no control. I'm literally wondering if this is like how things are just gonna be. I was, I was literally wondering, wait, did I use something worse? I'm, I'm out of my mind at the moment. I'm literally thinking, what, am I like him? Like clearly the, the police officers thought that I was equal to this guy because they put us in the same container. I felt horrible. I was, I was by the end of that ride, I was crying. Now, obviously, how, how well do you think someone in that situation next to you, we were handcuffed together. How well do you think he treats you when he sees that you're crying? I, I had to like stop crying immediately. Otherwise they see it as a sign of weakness and then fuck, fuck with you even more. And it was, it was horrible. I just, it was, it was literally like, it's funny that you mentioned the health thing because at the time I didn't look at it that way until you both kind of taught me this and kind of allowed me to, to really express it this way. But there was several moments where I thought, oh, this is gonna be the rest of my life. Like they're not gonna, something's gonna happen. There's gonna be a misunderstanding where I'm gonna be like this forever. And I just thought, oh, this isn't gonna end. This is, this is now what the result of my actions were. So I, I, I quickly realized how many people don't necessarily care about you or care about your well-being. I was like, wait, so I've based my whole self-esteem on the thoughts of these other people. And then I just, my girlfriend only liked me because of my status. My friends only liked me because of the fun times that I gave them, right? I was Luke, the, the fun times kind of guy, right? Where everyone could like confide in me, but then for some reason, nothing that I confided in them stayed. It, it like left and it was uh, super painful. You know, I mean, I, to this, to the point where even you talking to me about it now makes me like remember how I actually felt with these people. It was, um, yeah, that was definitely in the top three, like worst periods of my life for sure. Mm -hmm. How do you think you began to shift your perspective to dig out of it? I did it for a long time. Um, I was, uh, after that day, I just, I was, I was so taken aback. Like I literally felt empty. I was so taken aback that these people weren't in the situation with me. It was almost like we had all robbed the bank and I was the only one who my shoe was tied. I'm tying my shoe and like they all just bolted and now I'm the one stuck kind of holding the bag, you know? It was literally like I'm, it's like I was the scapegoat for all of our fun. And then I was sitting there just being like, well, was this really worth it when like you just want, it was like they all just wanted a meal ticket for the fun. But then when I got, when I, when I got out of that situation, I was sitting there being like, oh, I'm just left here uh, with nothing. I was, I was, it was the craziest experience where I was thinking, wow, so you're not even there to like help me through the pain. Like what kind of friends are you? It was, it was like, they helped, they encouraged me to get into the negative position I was in. And then none of them were even, if anything, they were judging me for the negative well, reputation. That, that's 100% what happened to you. With your thing. Everyone's like, oh, and then those same people are like, oh, oh, oh. I mean, literally the guy who came up with the idea to go to Japan and make all that crazy shit and then was videoing you doing it was like, oh, I can't be associated to that. I could never do something like, like the same dude who recorded it. <laughs> like, that's so crazy. And, 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 um, and kind of like would shame you, to, you know, for that. And you saw that with yeah, the exact same people who were encouraging um, him in that direction were... Uh, not remotely there, just like rats off a sinking ship. And it's, it's also the, the, uh, the epiphany of the fakeness of what you had going. There's an inauthenticity yeah. to it. In the Hollywood scene, we, we see a lot of that, right? Where, you know, you see, um, there, it's like uh, these social circles that you see in Hollywood that are just beyond, beyond fake. You know, like, like I, had a, I have a buddy who did an amazing party, got shut down early. He spent so much money on that party to make everyone have a great night. And then when they're all walking on the party, like, ugh. We had to leave early. Ew. And I'm like, oh my God, this guy really put his heart and soul to make an amazing party. And all you can think about is that, is that you had to leave early. People don't give a fuck about you. Bro. I think the craziest thing about it for me was that I felt, because every, every city has fake people, right? Whether it's Hollywood where it's more apparent or whether it's um, a Midwest town where every, you know, where, where people yeah, are cheating on each other with their neighbor. Like there's always, the, the fakeness is kind of everywhere, just how it, how it gets exuded. The part for me was when it's almost like a, like a waiter pulling the, the, um, the tablecloth really quickly and then all the glassware stays on the table. I literally felt like everything got, got shifted for me. I was living in almost like the Truman Show 
where I was like, I was going up to my, my friends afterward and literally every person in my life, almost like being like, are you real? Like, I was like, I don't understand. Like, I was so confused. I was like, I don't, like, it was, it was literally not only like I was empty, but everyone around me was empty. And then it was so weird because it, it was like, like, it was almost like I could, I would, okay, once it happened, it was almost like my senses were heightened and I could see them snickering. They weren't really snickering, but I could see like glances. I could see the way that they would like look around me. And I was thinking, you're only friends because of me. You're only this. And at the same time, it wasn't tr trying to take credit for it. I was, it was just very fascinating that it was literally like I was on the Truman Show. And I was trying to reach the end and peel apart like where this show stops and the real world kind of begins. Um, and I had blocked the negativity out with all these seemingly positive experiences of what really were just in instant gratification, right? I was trying to like dull, like numb the pain with instant gratification. But then what ended up happening is I realized, oh, like once I kind of pulled through that Truman Show wall, essentially, I realized, oh, well, everyone has their own motivations. Everyone, the optics of the situation, everyone has their own desires on why they're here doing all these things. So I need to look out for myself to be more on a more positive upward trajectory. Mm. Yeah, or to learn, I think a big process for Julie and I was to learn to forgive. Literally just because so many of our friends, um, you know, really just took advantage of the situation or, or scapegoated or, or tried to distance themselves, that it was like you'd literally lose about 90% of your friends. It happened to me after the book, The Game, as well. Um, all these relationships that I'd spent years building um, wouldn't return my phone calls, wanted nothing to do with me. And um, so it's happened to me a number of times, actually. It's actually pretty funny. <laughs> like, this has happened several times, or that feeling of being hunted several times. And um, what you learn over time is, is the feeling to forgive. You have to, like, one thing my buddy Jesse, uh, he gave me good advice. I was like, man, do I just have no friends anymore? He goes, Owen, look. He's like, don't give up all your friends. He's like, just change. He's like, you got to make it like, like circles. This is like trusted friends, and this is like affiliated friends. And you've got to just bump a lot of the people that were in the trusted. You've got to push back to affiliated and then just don't even bring up what happened because they'll never admit to it. It is what is human survival mechanism. Fuck it. And that was sort of a, a big factor um, for me as well. And um, I think that uh, actually because we're running so hardcore deep into this video, I'd love to get you to talk actually about what happened to you. I think you should really talk about it. So Evie, what happened to him was um, a very bizarre thing where I've seen you walk into a living hell um, where you almost killed yourself drinking, which is super weird. You might want to talk a little bit about yeah. that one as well because that was one of the craziest things <clears throat> in my entire life. Let me tell you something. You, at this version of yourself, will never get over her. But the new version of you will have different preferences, different experiences, so you have to evolve to your next level. But in addition to that, you have to become present, right? So you have to make a choice to go into presence. Well, for me, it was actually a very similar story that um, Luke just talked about, where I based my inner happiness on something external. And in my particular case, it was relationship as well, where I based my positivity and my inner happiness on a girl that wasn't fully available to me. I was dating a girl at the time that she was married, and she couldn't fully give me the validation that my inner psyche needed. And I was hooked on chasing and chasing it again and again and again. And in the beginning, uh, things started going sideways when um, I was so stressed from stressing about the, I was so stressed about the girl and spending more time with her and stuff like that, that I started having problems with sleep. Like start simple, like, okay, you can't really, get a full night deep sleep, okay, cool, well, let's take some melatonin or whatever, right? So then you start taking melatonin, then it doesn't stop stops working at a certain time. Then you're like, well, let's do something crazier. Let's start going a little bit deeper and let, because the melatonin doesn't work anymore. So I went to the doctor, I got prescribed with, um, with a sleeping pill, okay, cool. Well, now I'm taking sleeping pills. What pill? uh, it was uh, Zaleplon. It was like, uh, it's a um, typical medicine for insomnia. So then that shit doesn't work. Well, and relationship you're, was... You're literally going on this crazy pill because of the, your situation. Yeah, and uh, in the moment, the reason why I let it go that deep, because in the moment it feels like breaking up with that person and going your own way is a lot worse than being with her. Like, it almost feels like pain of leaving. <laughs> could have almost said you're a man who went uh, his own way. <laughs> yeah, so the, uh, at the time, Pain of leaving seems a lot harder than 
pain of just staying and kind of coping with it. So we would kind of go back and forth with seeing each other, then, oh, not seeing each other for a week or two. Then, again, seeing each other all the time, because I'm still not seeing. So it was kind of like this roller coaster, emotional roller coaster, and I was completely hooked on it, like 100%. I, like at the time, I would give anything to like marry the girl. Like r- today, like it doesn't matter at all. So I'm like, well, I'm not leaving her, so I need to cope with my day-to-day existence. Um, I like I got super depressed. So the only times I would feel really happy was when I was actually with her. She didn't know any about any of this stuff going on because I wouldn't tell her that. So because I didn't want to seem like the low value, so I'm not gonna tell her the way I feel. Um, so the only times I was really, really happy is when I was with her. Then we would have amazing times. She would go home, back to her husband. I would feel like shit until the next time I saw her. So I had to cope some, somehow with the way I felt in between the times I would see her. So then I went to the doctor, got a prescription for antidepressants. They were the antidepressants that make you sleep. It's basically... Um, I don't remember the name of it. Um, it makes you feel super weird. It makes you feel super sleepy. The first time I took it, I slept for like 18 hours straight. Jeez. Just goes to show like the, the amount of stress I had at the time. I couldn't even relax properly. So I would take the pill and I would go to bed. And that's how I would function on a day-to-day basis. Then also, because of that emotional roller coaster and stress, I kept seeing her, obviously. And I had to somehow function during work hours, right? I had a regular job at the time where I had to show up and like, be a responsible human being for eight hours a day. I couldn't do that, so then you take uppers to stay focused. Then you take downers to get off the uppers. Then you drink more when you go out to kind of numb that and socialize with other people. Because you can't even be like you at the, uh, at the time of like, going out and socializing with people. You can't even be you, really. So you have to drink to numb all, all that shit. So basically, it was slowly becoming... an. Uh, no, not, not at the time. I started smoking a little later. But um, it was kind of a, a slope of going down. But I was so convinced at the time that leaving would be more painful than staying and somehow figure out a way. And I s- wanted that validation from that girl so bad that I just couldn't stop. That's the biggest drug of all of them. Yeah, like Julie. I've definitely been in situations with girls where the, the girl... Not even to any fault of her own, but uh, where the girl was more of a drug than anything. Where um, I remember the the first girl this ever happened with. I remember literally things happened where it was it was more of a it was it was it was a ca- um, akin to a gambling addiction, where like there's these little bursts of reward. And I just remember like with her that was a worse drug addiction than I mean I'll just say it right than certain actual drug addictions that I've had. Like, the addiction to that girl was, like, I would start sweating the same way. I would have the come down effect the same way. It was literally, it's almost like if you could actually, you know, someone smarter than me could put some, some sort of science experiment at play. Maybe they have already done this, where they actually see the addiction to people or the addiction to, to kind of other things and see how much stronger it is than the addiction to, uh, than the addiction to an actual drug, right? What I found is that, like, like, every time that you smoked the weed or took the, like, for me, when I took antidepressants, it was almost like it's a slippery slope, but every time you take an antidepressant or smoke weed or whatever, it's like uh, your footing slips even more, and it aggressively shoves you down. You know? It was kind of crazy. So, uh, then you, you take a certain drug, for example, and then it makes you feel a lot better, or you drink some booze, it makes you feel a lot better, so you're like, oh, I found the solution, so I don't have to be feeling miserable all the time. So, but you take a very small dose, so you're like, well, it's never going to be a problem. It it's just like off. a little. It takes an edge off. Well, then it stops working, so you have to always try to find a new solution. Because you're not obviously breaking up. You're failing to recognize that it's going to be a better decision for both of you. Um, and you're continuing being in that downward loop. And like the slope just going down, 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 progressively to like smoking. Then... You start associating yourself with these low vibration things that in your mind you would never like ever do. I was training professionally for tennis for maybe like 17, 16 years before that. It's like smoking is something so ridiculous to me. It's like smoking. I, I would look at the person that smokes and be like, you're just... And uh, at that time you really associate with it. And... Um, the way it felt at certain points of that relationship when going like back and forth in that like when you're in that shit, it feels like being awake just hurts and period. I remember waking up and like that that's the, the best way I would describe this all low vibration thing and 
feeling like demented, it hurts to be awake. Yeah. You just want to be asleep no matter what. I remember the times I would wake up. Sometimes I, like, I would have a dream about her. I would wake up and sweat. And I couldn't wait for the time either to see her or to go to bed sooner. Like I wanted my day to end as fast as possible. That's how if you think about it now when I'm like completely out of it and I feel amazing about my life in general and my inner happiness, the way you think about it is like how fucked up things can get when you actually don't want to be awake. You know with uh, like how many uh, suicides have been happening, right? Uh, it seems to be more now than ever. And Anthony Bourdain, who, you know, it, you'd almost never... Like, step, like, it's amazing when the suicides happen with somebody that you'd actually look at their life and, be, and just kind of look at it, well, what more could you want than what this person has or has, has, has um, you know, their life has, has portrayed? And it's interesting. I never would ever think that I would ever be suicidal or, or think that negatively. But the way you just described it is exactly what it is. It's not necessarily that you have this romantic idea of, of some sort of like poetic justice of, of killing yourself in some way, right? It's that idea of like, it just feels better to not be awake. I truly believe that in a lot of ways, RSD saved my life because I was living the life by the metric and the rubric mm -hmm. that I thought was, like I was living a 10 out of 10 life for everything that I had, for every scale that I had made for myself, right? It was, I, I was literally thinking, state, who cares about state? Look at me, I'm living this exact life that I had been jealous of and envious of my whole childhood, so now I'm exactly where it is. But I didn't realize the negatives that would have associated with it. But it did get to a point where I remember some of the, the, the highest of the highs where I'm surrounded by all these people. I'm living that, like, I always called myself a, a rock star without a band, because I was living the exact same life of a rock star, just without actually performing. It was really kind of funny. And then I just remember those times, like what you just said, where it's actually... Like, I, I just looked forward to the times where I wasn't awake. And that's where it got scary, where I was like, oh, I gotta fix something, because I never had this weird idea of wanting to kill myself in some crazy way, but it was always like, wait, 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 I'd rather be sleeping right now. That's a weird tunnel to go down. Well, I remember we were in New York, and you were preparing for your CNN interview. <laughs> and I remember at one point I was like, I was like, dude, um, it's like middle of the day, and I'm like, I need to like just go to sleep. And you're like, yeah, I'm like, I'm, I'm good. I just gotta go to sleep. And it, it, it's, it's a sleep that is not needed uh, for um, a, a normal nighttime sleep. It's literally that you're, you're so, you, you cannot bear to be awake mm. and you need some time off. Then you go to sleep and it's like, ah. Oh. But then when you wake back up, you're like, was that a dream? And that, there was a very, like what we dealt with, there was a very dreamlike, nightmare-like to be fair, nightmare-like yeah. quality to it. But um, <laughs> Yeah, that thing went to the point where, um, I would start drinking a lot more and then I couldn't stop when I started. So uh, let's say I would remember, that was like probably a year and a half deep. I would s remember starting drinking, but I wouldn't remember when I stopped. Like it was just a haze of like four days of like nothingness. Because the way I would drink, I, w I was told by other people. I had no idea this was going on. Mm -hmm. So I would drink, then I would go to bed. It's like that hurt to f hurts to feel awake and it really worked with me uh, afterwards. Um, and then I would wake up, go straight for the booze, keep drinking while I'm in that haze. So essentially I was never, like, I would never wake up type of thing. Which is fucked up to think about because I wasn't necessarily suicidal, you, like how you would say it. Like I wouldn't pull the trigger, take, like, take the gun out and pull the trigger. But that feeling of constant pain where you're just like, you don't want to be awake. So like, what's the solution? And when you're in that shit, you actually don't see the light in the end of the tunnel. I had no idea it's ever gonna get better. So I'm like sitting there, uh, same thing, getting arrested on a couple occasions that I don't think I've ever shared to like pretty much no one. And then uh, going into the hospital a couple times when I was like with three needles in my arm with like IVs and stuff. That's sure, how- You got a huge bill for it too. Oh yeah, I mean, oh, but- I mean, at, th at this point I don't really care, but like at that time it was like- What was the bill? Uh, it was like two, three grand, something like that. Jeez. And each time it was like that. So mm. it was, there, were, there were two of those. And then, um, yeah, like getting arrested too for like being drunk in public type of thing. Because I didn't remember where the fuck I was. I was probably on the way to the store. Once I think, once I was in that haze, I actually called this girl to pick me up. She picked me up and like took care of me. But on other occasions, I was like too embarrassed to even call. Because I was like all fucked up. My room is like all full with bottle. It was like, it was terrible terrible scenery and uh, the reason why I continue it I believe happening is because it feels it literally feels like 
if you stop the relationship, it's going to hurt a lot more. And you, you're, like, afraid you're going to, like, F yourself off or something. Like, it's completely crazy. And so uh, the last time when I had any, um, any relation to alcohol or fixing myself with drugs was when I was last time in the hospital. I was in, um, in Vegas with my friend there. And um, at some point, I just had to make a decision. Like, am I making the firm cut? And am I actually surviving this? And fi- no matter how painful it is, am I gonna like get out of it at some point, or am I just gonna like f myself off and like and end it pretty much? Not necessarily like pull the trigger, but the consequences of me like drinking for four days straight, not remembering, I can just like walk across the road, get hit by a car. Mm. And I also had like um, before that, I had an intervention with the family that was living at the time. They're like, okay, well, we're gonna take you to the rehab. Because you have obviously like a drug and drink problem. I'm like, well, you don't understand. I don't actually have the drug and drink problem. That's like, that's the girl that, that's why I'm doing it. But obviously there is some shit going on inside me. Like that seeking validation thing that I just absolutely had to get her. Otherwise I'm like completely unhappy. And that's kind of was a very powerful lesson where in any relationship that I have now, even with friends or with maybe intimate partners or whatever, it's like I have to be happy on my own before letting anything outside affect me. Like if you look at our Instagram or the YouTube videos, it's like our life looks like the best of the best. Like we travel all the time, we eat at all these cool places, like, what, like all these girls, like what, what else do you want, right? But you have to always remember, like if that's taken away from you, you have to be happy on your own. Mm-hmm. You can't let anything outside affect you. Because the moment you do that, then you end up in a hospital with three IVs in you. Yeah. And you're like, how did I get to this point? Mm-hmm. I can and tell you too what you look like, by the way. I can was that? It. Yeah, I mean, I, so, I didn't know that. So it's well, like, what I saw was... <laughs> and, but it was so, as, I, as I was handcuffed mm. to a bed yeah. by our good friend at nighttime, so mm-hmm. I wouldn't like at night wake up and go like drink myself to death. Yeah, well, well, here's what I saw. So I, kn- I knew you, and um, I know you as this like very sharp, bright guy, you know, any, I'm, I'm a father of two, you know, I have two sons. Anytime that you, you imagine your sons being, you know, bright, engaged, sharp, self, self-starters, motivated, you know, you've, you've got these qualities. So then I'm seeing you, um, uh, you know, you, I knew that you had this, this ex-girlfriend from this like little town that you were like staying in and you know, you're in, you're, mind, it's like a big joke. Yeah, it's a joke. Yeah, it's literally a joke to me. Right. But, and, <laughs> and particularly for a guy like yourself who, who, and she's, she's awesome. Like she's, awesome awesome but you're a very capable guy of meeting so many different people that to think that that would be what's messing you up it seems beyond the imagination essentially it's crazy man um and and so i i see you kind of like seeing her um a little bit and because she kind of came down to visit right and she's kind of blown away with with your setup because we're living in the mansion and she's coming to visit you in the mansion, seeing you with all these like friends and stuff. She's probably totally blown away. So she wants to keep hooking up with you and you're going back to her. To me, it's like funny, you know, it's like, ah, ha, ha, get the ex to like, you know, show the ex that you're like balling. Like, it's like awesome. You know, I'm like loving it. You know, it's awesome. You didn't know the free story. Like, yeah. I even <laughs> I didn't tell you so much. Yeah. Yeah. Like I even, I even like, <laughs> you, you know, encourage it. Like, encourage yeah. it. I <laughs> thought it was great. <laughs> that was, that was awesome. Look what you did. Yeah, I know. Right. <laughs> That's what did. It's all mine. Well, I paid the price on that too, so I guess so. But um, uh, then, then I then then at one point, I think like I had heard that you got drunk, right? And then I think like I can't remember the first time that that I saw it. And I, I remember you like kind of came out to the to the gazebo, and you look all spaced out. And and I was like, this is weird. Like, what the fuck? You know, what is this, right? And I, I just thought that like I thought it was kind of funny, like as if any of you guys just like, got drunk or like. You know, like one of our friends just got drunk. I'm like, I just fucked up. Like, it's kind of random. I actually had my shit mm. together pretty well in mm. like in those like first two months, three when we like reconnected. Mm. The first time I actually got drunk mm. when we like finally broke up again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like yeah. after that, that was the like the first time when I like in the process of it, I could like kind of keep my shit together. Now you're balling. You're like <laughs> loving it, and then yeah, but then after like, after the final cut, and I realized like holy shit, like. Uh, I'm actually never going to see her again. Mm-hmm. And I have to make that, not because I don't like her or I don't think she's an amazing person, because 
I need to do it because otherwise I'm going to F myself off mm. in, yeah. in one way or the other. Yeah. Well, what, it, what, it, what it looked like to me, like you, you saw about drunk. I think it's kind of, I'm like, it's like as if, I, as if I show up with like some random shit. You know, like say, I, say like you just see me with like some like processed Cheetos thing that, and I'm like, like say you saw me eating like, I don't know, what's some like horrible thing that you're not supposed to eat? Like, just puppies. Yeah, like I'm eating some like weird fried piece of shit, you know, and I'm like, just kind of, you know, and you're, and you're like, what's up, Owen? I'm like, eating the fucking fried shit. Fried shit, you know, and you're like, okay. I'm like, want some, you know? Coca Cola, your favorite. Yeah, like I never drink Coca Cola, right? So I'm just kind of pounding down Coca Cola's or like Big Macs or something, you know what I mean, right? And you're like, okay, like, that's cool. <laughs> do it you know right like I said you drunk I was like fuck it like <laughs> sweet you know I didn't I did only one day yeah yeah but then I think like the next day you're still drunk right like it took me a minute because I'd never even seen you drinking right mm-hmm. and when you drink you go if you look at levels of energy by David R. Hawkins mm-hmm. the lowest levels apathy you go into this like crazy fucking apathy or, or uh, power versus force by David R. Hawkins levels of energy by Frederick Dawson. So you go into the lowest vibration, you go right into apathy. So you'll get this weird um, facial expression where you're like, hey, yeah, okay. And you'll even say you'll stop drinking. Like, right, I'll stop. Time I really believe it. I'm like, okay, I'm gonna do everything I can. Yeah. But now, it takes like so many now, times. Now here's what I saw. You were so steeped in low vibration energy. It was as if, okay, the consciousness of Evie has receded. There's no more you and the alcohol is just running you, and the alcohol just wants more alcohol. Now, you'll notice that, and again, coming back to this kind of health theme, part of this whole idea of health theme is that there's this need. There's a fixation, a lack. And the, 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 you know, the cocaine user always, like the biggest thing they say about people on cocaine is like they want the next hit of cocaine. If you have a, co- you know, if you have a cocaine bag, like you're gonna go through that bag. Like, the, like almost like with potato chips, like you can't eat just one, like Frito-Lays, like cocaine is like Frito-Lays, like times X, whatever. And that's just what I read about it. And same thing with like alcohol. It's like, it's just like, it's just one more drink, just one more gamble, just one more with the girl. It's like, it's, it's that fixation or addiction. And you're, you're, you're traveling into, um, and Gabriel Monte calls that in the realm of hungry ghosts. The hungry ghost is a Buddhist metaphor where the, 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 the uh, hungry ghost has this big fat belly and this long mouth and can never get quite what they need. And there's like a fixation. So then basically you're, you're going into, into such low vibration. And then you're, um, the, the alcohol is physically writing you. Like you're not there. So, yeah, and, and, like, and, I don't even remember it. And, and while you're drunk, we would handcuff you and then you'd go missing for a couple days. Or no, not, or not missing. You'd go missing. And then we'd find you like at Ralph's, like you've been drinking at Ralph's or something. You start pissing yourself. You're unconscious. And it got to the point where um, you would, uh, you, you're, you, when you'd come back to normal, we'd think you're back to normal, but you're still a little bit drunk. So you'd, you'd go to bed drunk, wake up drunk. And then we think you're back, you're normal. You're like, yeah, I'm not going to drink and Drink again. Go back unconscious for another couple of days. We're having to handcuff you. You're sneaking away at every chance. Every, if there's not someone on you 24-7 sitting on you, back to drinking. And then what, what's happening is the alcohol is physically running your brain. So, so the key here is, the proactive consciousness, the proactivity is gone. There's no more, the, your, your body's there, your brain's there, but your brain's like fucking pickled. And basically like the proactive consciousness is gone. And what scared me, what it looked like to me, when I'd see you do this for like five, six days, it looked like you would, it, it really felt like, almost like if you took a frog back to a swamp and it would just swim in the swamp, you'd never see your pet frog again. It's like, you could, I could just release you into like downtown LA and maybe you would just live with the homeless people, the bright young guy, and you would just never come back. Like there wouldn't be an EV to come back. The alcohol is just there. It would keep drinking to like sustain itself and it would never come back. And you would just live in this hell realm on earth. Homeless people to me are one of the most powerful signs of, of a connection to that hell realm because they, the, there's, there's, the, the consciousness isn't there for them to even fix it, right? It's so funny when you say to a, um, you know, like say to like a mass murderer, like they should have just realized that they need to take responsibility or that homeless guy needs to realize that he needs to, you know, he needs to work harder and don't be lazy. Like they're living in a hell realm. There's demented, demonic energy running them. It doesn't matter what you say to them. Like, don't do this any more than if I'd gone to you and said, stop drinking. There's not even anyone home to stop drinking. If I said to you, don't do the crazy shit or to yourself the crazy shit. There's not, and, and if anyone said to me when I'm doing my crazy shit, there's no one home to even get that message. You're being run. 
you're in a you're 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 in the same physical reality, but you're in a different energetic reality where you're being run by that energy and good fucking luck. And the only way out of it a lot of times is to go through it. And then you have the karmic payback. And at the karmic payback time, you've got a choice. You either, they say you get better or bitter. And you can say, I'm going to repent and I'm going to come back to center and back to presence and back to giving. Or I just want to keep going down. And that, and that's, and, and unfortunately, some people, they say homelessness and stuff. There's many explanations as well as mental illness, but many of them, they choose to continue doubling down and going down almost like as if you were like, fuck this, fuck this. And you just, yeah. you know, had kept going down, right? And, um, that's you, most people. Like I, like I said, I'm fucking lucky that I let go because that, like that pull, it's like boom. Like there's a weight and you're sinking. You know. Mm. Um, one thing I'll say too with the um, homeless side of thing is like what we talked about here is like just visiting it, but some people just stay stuck in there, and it's very easy to stay stuck. And if you stay stuck long enough, I mean, you're just fucked. Is it though? Nah, it's like a firecracker. A gun? Anyone can fall into it. You know, I remember a really good friend of ours, um, you know, a friend of mine who taught me, like, a lot of internet marketing, like, super smart guy, like, has an MBA and everything, like, really fucking smart. Um, I saw his, like, slow descent into this hell realm and just, you know, unfortunately just getting stuck in it from being, like, this really smart guy on top of his shit. Um, Kind of similar to what you were saying. It's, like, started with the drinking and then you kind of get numb to that. You drink more and more and more, start blacking out. Um, got into a relationship with a partner and they started enabling each other. Started doing like drugs, heavier, heavier, heavier drugs. And then um, it, it reached that point where there was like incidents with him with like a knife. Um, like another friend we have in common, like intervening, the cops being called. Uh, yeah, just him like in, in this completely other state. Like my friend showed this video that they had to show the police where he's holding him down. He's like, calm down, calm down. And, and my friend is just like, like another demon voice, like, just kill me, kill me. And then like, yeah, it went to the point where he's just like off the rails. And you're like, who is this guy? And he's just like, there, there's none of that same person left, you know, mm-hmm. just completely, yeah, like lost. El- and, and we've seen this with, with friends of ours, not as dramatic, yeah. but they're, you can't relate to them anymore. They've gone into that realm. And, uh, and by the way, I'll pass this over to you. I, I, I didn't tell the full story of my ex who you know and saw how that went down. Um, but I, I watch her just go right into hell. I mean, and then she's the closest person in my life. And um, it's such a long story. This video is already very long, but <laughs> I don't even know what to say, man. Like, well, it's crazy. Yeah, it's like you see, you it, know? it's like you look at, say, someone who's like really lost in that realm or someone who, you know, we're mentioning, say they're, they're homeless, like fighting over something. You're like, you know, how could they get that way? Like, that could be you. You know, it's so fucking easy. Like, it just starts slow, like a little drop, and then you just get stuck fucking the, sucked the down. The one too is domestic violence. Supposedly, I heard that like police, the biggest thing that they uh, that they have to deal with is domestic violence disputes. So that's one of the entry points of LVE. Drugs and alcohol is huge. Ego, girls, attacks, attachment, fixation, but the big one also domestic violence where apparently like a lot of police officers, they're just going from like <clears throat> domestic violence to domestic violence situations. Like super, this stuff's crazy common. Like it, between homelessness Entire countries immersed in, in wars, domestic violence, arguing, lack of potential, just the day, even, even just boiling it down to these day-to-day problems that, <clears throat> you know, that people deal with. You know, Evie, what, what you dealt with going into alcoholism and you coming, you know, out of that eventually, and we should do a lot more on that and how that worked. But it's like, it's like a lot of crazy stuff, you know, and, and you've got to start to open your eyes, and like, look a little deeper and think, what the fuck is going on here? I think the the bigger issue with like alcohol or introducing those things <clears throat> when you feel pain, it's not actually the alcohol that makes things a lot worse. It's, okay, well, now alcohol is aside. Now, how do I live my life without it? Because the issue why you even start drinking, taking drugs or whatever the fuck you're into is because you, like I said before, it, like, it hurts to be awake. You're trying to medicate that pain self-medicated away in like one way or the other and the issue when you drop all those things is kind of like re like relearning on how to be happy and not needing anything outside of you to feel happy on your own that's kind of the biggest thing with um, a lot of AA stuff and um, a lot of work that you do with people in those groups 
where you actually go out and like help homeless people, like go feed someone food, things like that. Just be of service to someone. It raises your vibration of energy, and at the level that you operate, you uh, you start feeling good about yourself. One of my goals when we went into this video was I said to everybody, I'm like, let's just let's just fucking twist the knife on this. Like, let's go really deep. Let's not hold anything back. Let's like really kind of push it out and kind of create an energy or an experience. So this is the kind of video that if you actually made it this far, you're, you're going to carry these memories with you. It gives you a bit more context of how we all teach, but also you're going to carry this with you to, to understand that there's certain realities that you're going to move through and experiences that you're going to have. And you've got to know how to move out of those, what process it takes to drop the trauma energy that's running you, learn how to recognize negative things that are coming at you, and learn how to shift that pattern of that take, take, take that generates the hell realm of lack and scarcity because the ultimate aspect of, of hell is, is the scarcity and, the, and how that triggers demen this demented, deranged shit and moving into abundance and giving and beauty and awesomeness. What this video is also designed to do is just really give you awareness that, you know, if you're in a hell realm now, it's like everyone goes there, you're not alone. You know, it's like, it's not like just you because that's like one thing too that... Um, like low vibration energy will do. It's like it convinces you you're alone in this. It's a very or like, selfish paradigm, actually. Yeah, like pain will do that. They convince it convinces you like you're alone with this pain. Like you're not. Okay, it's like we've all been there, and there is a way out. Okay, a lot of people have gone there. There is a way out. So remember that, and um, yeah, just start thinking about it. Like, what's driving me right now? Because it's very hard to see, as you mentioned, like when you're in that paradigm. It's like what's driving you. How do you feel? Like, is your experience of the world very light or is it heavy? And just start looking at other people too. It's like, uh, that person, you know, it looks a little heavier. It looks a little harder to be alive because we're all in the same physical world, but our experience is completely different. And then just see if you can see some people where it just seems a little easier, a little lighter and like, what's different there? You know, or what's perhaps holding me back from having that? And then after this stage of awareness, just diving deeper into what that is, releasing it, um, working on past trauma that's like a big cause of this and uh, slowly but surely moving out of it, you can, um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, this is what Gabriel Mate is, he works in addictions and he's he said that like the big revelation that he's trying to push is like, you're taking people, say with drug addiction, for example, you're, you're taking people that are traumatized, mm -hmm. homeless on drugs, and then you're putting them in prison system to get further traumatized. It's completely dysfunctional. You know, they're, they're trying to, you know, deal with all this shit, but it's not, it's not a, it, the system's not working as well as it could, clearly. So I think what's kind of cool is that in the, in the content that we create, there's everything from really practical, fun stuff that you can do, but also a lot of really deep work that you can do. And this is, this is an area that we've dived into for years, working with countless students, clients, viewers, and, you know, we posted here something we're super passionate about. I mean, look, to be honest, like, I don't even know if that's a fucking gunshot back there. And notice, like, we're so locked in and committed to what we do. We're like, you know, I got shot in the fucking head. <laughs> I'm going to finish this fucking thing. I mean, that's, and, I mean, it's stupid, right? I'm, I'm just like looking back here. I'm sure it's fine, but, <laughs> I think. but, you know, but the point is, like, that's how committed we are to it. And we're going to keep bringing you ideas. And, and we're very keyed into, like, again, that what if. What if there was heaven and hell on earth? We're very keyed into where that hell on earth gets produced and where the, the heaven and the cool part gets produced. If you're being run right now, we're gonna continue to work with you and show you how you're being run, where you're being run, what are ways to get out of it. We've lost friends to it, people we love dearly, sometimes in the public, sometimes in private. And um, we've been through things, we've seen it, we've, we've walked through the valley of the shadow of death and look fucking the most nasty, deranged, fucked up shit right in the pupil. And uh, it's, all, it's all good, you know? You'll watch so many other videos of us that are not done in front of a crazy looking thing back here and how much fun we're having. And it's not perfect, we're not perfect. We're on our, on our journeys like yourself. But there's a lot of information there. We're gonna keep putting it out. You're gonna keep seeing more and more of it. One of the really big, a, a couple, like we said, big takeaways are it's not forever. It's, it's, it's like an illusion of the mind. When you come out of it, you're like, what the fuck? Like, even for us, like the hardest part of like the crazy shit we went through is just like, it was really just traveling through that fog or wave, that fog of war of, of low vibration energy. Once you're out of it, it's like, whatever. I mean, even if things hadn't just wound up really terrible, we're resourceful guys, we would have figured it out. You know, we would have, but it's just like fucked up. You're a resourceful guy, no matter what happens, you're gonna figure it out. Same with you, Evie. You know, it's the same thing, you're gonna figure it out. But it's going through, it's, it's that process of traveling through the, the, the hell energy and going through that and then coming out of it and realizing that like in many ways, it's like we're being run by energies 
we're allowing it and also we're self-creating it and learning how to, to, how to turn those tides. And, and a really big one, again, is the scarcity versus abundance. That realm of the hungry ghost, the fat belly with the long beak, the needing, the needing for ego, for biological drives, for, um, for feeding into this weird energy that has its own momentum to it and really locking it and recognizing that energy that's being fed that has some momentum that isn't you and how you can wake up and begin to take more conscious control of what energies you're bringing into yourself and shift habits and shift perspectives and all of a sudden a hell realm can look pretty awesome. And uh, we're just gonna keep teaching you that, okay? This is a long, long video. I mean, we literally could do the whole like, flip side now and do hours on that. And we're gonna do that in, in upcoming videos. And if you made it this far, I just gotta thank you for, uh, for joining us for like a, a cool talk. This is my favorite piece of content that, um, that we've put together uh, in a long time. And uh, uh, I hope uh, if you made it this far, hopefully you feel the same way. So thanks very much. We're gonna probably pack and move down there before we even fully pack. Get the fuck out of here. <laughs> we'll see you soon. Peace. Peace. This is Julian, and welcome to Transformation Master. It was fucking amazing. This was huge for me. This was so, so important. This gave me by far the greatest epiphanies I've ever had. It just made me finally confront my deepest fears. And we got like real deep, and I found some issues within myself. One of the best things I've seen so far in my life. What you're about to experience going through this program is what completely changed my life on every single level, okay? Be it health, wealth, relationships, higher purpose, you name it, this is the stuff that finally, finally produced that true, long-lasting personal transformation we're all after.